Dear students, let us start the discussion on today's newspaper that is 29th July 2016. Today, the first article is related to the recent statement by Sharmila Chanu about her ending of the fast and hunger strike in Manipur. So in this case, let us try to understand the situation. There is Armed Forces Special Powers Act which is in operation in Manipur. As per this Armed Forces Special Powers Act, President can disturb any or can President can declare any area as a disturbed area and there the Armed Forces get some unaccountable powers where they cannot be prosecuted for any of their actions including causing death. So again is this, since 2000 she was on hunger strike and two days back she declared to end the hunger strike and wants to take a democratic process, get elected to Manipur Assembly and wants to fight from within the legislative house. And also she said that she wants to get married and lead a normal life. So this is what is all about this fight. So for the past 16 years, whatever the fight she did, it is about bringing the normalcy into the lives of the Manipur people. And the second important fact is, her confidence in the people of Manipur, Indian constitution, democratic process, that proves that proves how strong her will is and here she can be compared with Gandhiji. Gandhiji has tried many ethical means towards arriving or deriving the conclusive ends. She also separated her means and ends. The end is the repeal of the Armour Forces Special Powers Act and she is trying to just change the mean, means. So it means that the means may be different, the objectives did not change further. And finally, there is a difference between a protest as an ethical act and a terror. In this case, the protest as an ethical act, she represented with highest valor. Now coming to the 1991 reforms. This is 25th year of the reforms, so let's recollect what has happened. Ashwin Sinha was the finance minister before Manmohan Singh has come up in 1991 in the Rao government. So Ashwin Sinha he explains the circumstances that has led him to go for this or has led to uh, financial reforms. So in this case what he says is this. The Rajiv Gandhi government, Mr. I.G. Patel wrote a book. There was a huge expenditure made, a reckless expenditure is made. So the financial condition of the country got worsened. The short term debt was also increased and the short term debt is the most dangerous debt. And then India is on the brink of the crisis uh, during VP Singh era itself. But VP Singh uh, government was short lived. Then the Chandrasekhar government has come into existence. The Chandrasekhar government took the risk of uh, getting uh, some American jets getting fueled in Mumbai uh, as part of their uh, Gulf War. And the increased oil prices in the light of the Gulf War and then NRIs withdrawing their deposits and finally exporters also, they did not bring their currency, take the receipts on the hope that the currency will be devalued. Because of this there was a crisis situation in the country and then the gold is pledged to the Bank of Japan and Bank of England and to get some money. So at that point of time the agenda for the reforms was made but the Chandrasekhar government did not last long. So finally the reforms were implemented by Rao Manmohan Singh Dio. Now the second thing is today the most of the economic reforms they are continuing but these economic reforms also be associated with the democratic reforms if you and governance reforms. If we see him the municipal administration in the country and also the personal administration, anything and everything if you take about uh, there is a stagnation. So reforms in India shall not be like uh, a one stop thing, they are a continuous process. But the problem is uh, most of the reforms other than in the economic sector they are incremental and they suffer from stop and go syndrome. It means a new government, inform inclined government comes up, they move forward and then they stop, they move forward, they stop. This need to be averted. Now coming to next article. Here you know that by 2022 we have certain targets to reach with regard to the renewable energy. We want to achieve 100 gigawatts of energy from solar, 
and 60 gigawatts from wind. Now it's almost kind of increasing it by 40-50 times. So in these circumstances, non-conventional energy is an expensive energy. So to finance this expensive energy, government can rely on green bonds. So these green bonds can provide for the necessary financial infrastructure. That's what this article talks about. It says some technical aspects of the green bonds need to be introduced. We need not think about it. Now coming to setback at Hague. Now let us see the things. The first one is Vodafone, Kane Energy. Now we have Devas Multimedia. All of them have one thing common. That's what they have pulled the government of India into arbitration in uh, the International Arbitration Tribunal at Hague. Now, this is what is called as sovereignty and in investor dispute or state investor disputes. Now, especially with regard to Devas Multimedia, the, it has come to uh, come in to deal with Anthrix Corporation to shape the S-band spectrum. But however, after CAG, he has brought some doubts uh, onto the uh, size of the deal and the probable corruption in it. Finally, government suspended that. Then there was multimedia challenged that in permanent uh, this particular court of arbitration, and it has ordered the government of India to pay around 1.4 billion in damages to the there was multimedia. So in this case, the government wants to revise its bilateral investment promotion agreements uh, so that the state investor uh, uh, disputes will not be taken into the international arbitration tribunals uh, unless they are not solved in the local judiciary. So with regard to the Devas Multimedia, it was a mishandling by government of India and it failed to produce the necessary documents before the arbitration tribunal. Now coming to pay commission recommendations. The pay commission recommendations they affect the government in two ways, especially the state governments in two ways. One is the demand for the pay revisions also increases in the states. They create unnecessary burden on the fiscal policy of the states. And the next is all India service officers. They are paid by the state governments as the salaries of them are also revised. It is going to increase the burden, fiscal burden on the states. That's why the states ask for a consultation and sharing of the burden whenever the 7th pay commissions revise the salaries of the government employees. And the second thing is, the central government also gains from state governments um, uh, raising the salaries for its employees because income tax goes to the center. So as the salaries of the state government employees are raised, um, the income from the state is getting or is entering into the union government. And another thing is, um, there is a parity between IAS and other services. IAS gets uh, two years of automatic seniority when compared to the same year selections in IPS, IFS and other central services. Now, the demand from these other services is to bring in parity between them and IAS. So let us see what happens on this. Now coming to asset disclosure. Now if you take the Lokpal Act 2013, a public servant has to declare his assets, assets of his spouse and the dependent children. So in this case, the public servant definition also includes an organization receiving funds greater than 10 lakhs from the foreign entities and also if the organization is getting the grants from the government they are covered under the definition of the uh, the public servant so in this case the ngos so these also come now under the purview of the prevention of corruption act and the lokpal so to what extent is it appropriate because the NGOs and their office bearers, they don't work on salary, but they are work on voluntary basis. Bringing them and their family center, this network, probably will hurt their privacy. And even if the same case applies towards the public servants. And second, there are few initiatives already taken. If you see, with regard to politicians, after the judgment of the Supreme Court from 2002, there is a declaration of assets and uh, so all by the uh, politicians before they participate in the elections. Uh, in 2005, you know the RTI has come into existence. As for the Chief Information Commissioner's uh, uh, judgment, uh, the salaries of the public employees also need to be displayed. They come under the purview of the RTI. In spite of the asset declaration, 
the number of people coming to the parliament and the legislative institutions with a corrupt or also with a, a record or cases pending against them have increased rather than being decreased. So it means that the Lokpal Act today also want to bring in the disproportionate assets to the notification of the people and also bring in investigation on these matters. But if you carefully observe, the Lokpal was given the authority to collect the information but did, did not have the necessary machinery to look into these matters. Now, a fierce campaigner, Mahasweta Devi, uh, a writer from Bengal, she has passed away and she is a social activist and also a political activist. In 2011 elections she has fought. Now she has rallied for Mamata Banerjee and she won Gnanapita Award and Raman Megasase Award, Saitya Academy Award. Now coming to history. Now history can be seen as a science which has to be a construct based on rationality and verifiable facts. But however, today if you see the composition of ICHR, it is filled more with glorification of the past and the national glorification. So in this context, Mr. Irfan Habib brings in this particular genre as a kind, new kind of fascism. So anywhere where the fascism grew, it is based on the national glorification and divisiveness and attack on rationality and reason. So that's how this particular fascism and Nazism grew. So in this case, so he, I mean, he tried to explain the reason has to prevail in the academic circles. Now the resettlement courses, you all know that um, the Javans gets, uh, gets retired and these Javans need to be provided for an alternative employment. So in this case, there's a department which is working uh, in defense ministry. Now, what it has been said is the, the Department of Resettlement. So it started itself developing an MOU with Skill Development and Entrepreneurship Ministry where the special courses will be devised for the Rajavans who are retired. So these are the articles for today. Thank you very much. A small announcement, students. I'm, in all, I'm traveling in the next entire week. So because of this, the videos may come at inappropriate times. I request you to follow the video in the evening so that by the morning I can get the things done for you. So thank you very much and all the best.